We are joined by our very good friend Kate Margraff for an initial reaction to the news. Kate is on the phone. Kate, uh, did the timing of this news surprise you? Were you taken aback at all? <laughs> well, anytime there's a release after the lunch hour, it, it was well timed by U.S. Soccer's part. But I am not surprised as much as perhaps I would have been three weeks ago. Uh, right towards the finals, there were starting to be a little bit of rumblings inside the bubble that perhaps this might be it if Jill were to win it because she'd want to go out on top. Winning back-to-back -back competitions within less than 12 months is very difficult. And I think she saw a a huge jump in her team's performance. And at this point, I think she's just like, I've done everything. I've done something that no coach has ever done in U.S. soccer history, and I want that to be part of my legacy. Okay, if you can, just briefly put her career in, uh, in perspective, because uh, when she took over in 2014, she wasn't always the most popular choice. Well, she, she's had her critics all the way along, despite all this success. Yeah, she did. You know, she got the job after Tom Sermani appointment didn't work out and she took over from someone inside the program she was running the youth teams and at first it was a bit of a learning curve in 2015 she made some uh, bad decisions I would say during the World Cup but was able to recorrect it quickly and they ended up winning in 2016 some roster choices that were questionable and it was the earliest loss from a US team in a major competition bowing out in the quarterfinals and that's when Jill Ellis show that she could learn from her mistakes. She completely revamped the entire program, brought in 60 new players to get evaluations. It angered the starting group so much that they tried to get her fired in 2017, but she stayed the course, and U.S. Soccer kept her on, and we got to see what happened with this new style of play, with new players on the team, and she can walk away knowing that she helped build for the next generation that will be in the next cycle due to all the tough growing pains learned since the 2016 loss. And Kate, on that point, is it, is it fair to say she's now left them in a position of strength, the like of which they perhaps haven't been in since your 99 team? Oh, I don't know if I'd go that far because they have a number of players over the age of 30 that, and quite honestly, you know, the team didn't play great soccer throughout the entire tournament, but they played the right tactics and style each game to find a way to win. And that is something when you look out, you think that the England and France, who collectively might have been playing better soccer when you get to watch them and individually player for player might be more talented, their coaches made the wrong choices. So you have to imagine those coaches are going to learn from those mistakes. So I think it, winning back-to-back -back is going to be a huge challenge. Kate, okay, finally, uh, of course, this doesn't take effect for five games. She'll do the victory tour, uh, maybe get the, the record number of wins, but the wheels will start turning immediately who is going to uh, succeed, Jill Ellis? Who's next? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. One I wish I could tell you so I could put some money down and make a ton and be able to pay for college. Uh, I, you know, Laura Harvey's <laughs> a name that gets thrown out quite a bit. Paul Riley, who has been the most successful NWSL coach for North Carolina. Uh, Vladko out of uh, the rain out in Washington. Those are some of the three professional coaches that you hear their names rolling around. And, you know, there's one college coach that I think is very well respected. His name is Mark Krikorian, who coaches at FSU, just won the National national championship, but has his pulse on the international game more than any other college coach, I think, in the country. That is someone that I think that everyone would want to take a look at along with those professional coaches. Great stuff, Kate. Thanks for joining us at very short notice. I will see you in uh, Pasadena for the start of that victory tour on, uh, on Saturday. All right, Adrian. See you soon. Thank you. Yeah, Kate Margraff uh, there for us, uh, guys. Just, just in summing up, uh, Vittorio Pozzo, the only other person, man or woman, to win two consecutive World Cups, and that was in the 1930s. Well, it, it's a great achievement, but what you heard there was that the best coaches learn from their mistakes. You know, that it's, being a coach is never easy. You're going to have times when things aren't going to go your way. And she learned from her mistakes and they won the World Cup. And it's a great performance from her and a great career so far. I, I think especially when it comes to the women's game, where you are judged not just on, on the World Cups as, as the major men's programs are, but also with the Olympics, where your, your own feed can, can be sealed in, in, in failure or success, which is what happened to, to Jill Ellis in 2016, yeah. as Kate is pointing out, with the disappointments of their performance in, in Brazil, but on the back of, of being crowned world champions a year earlier in Canada. And yet still, 
when men when men's coaches have have those successes over that prolonged period of time it's usually with a core group of players but post the the, the disappointments of 2016 Jill Ellis refurbish refurbishes program uh, much as chagrin of, of, of many many of the ex existing players and again has, has come out as winner that is a, a feat um, I, I don't think many can accomplish and certainly I, I don't think any any in the men's game would have to deal with. Well, thank you very much for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming, premium content, and let's not forget as well, ESPN FC, seven days a week. Subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.